I just sent a really angry tweet, which is a great way to get this started. <laughs> uh, I'm Greg Dunlap. I'm the initiative lead for the uh, configuration management initiative for Drupal 8. Uh, you can find me on the interwebs all over the place as Hayrocker. Um, I want to talk about um, how we can make our core development practices more sustainable. And I'm probably going to focus on one thing, but if we have other things to talk about, feel free. Two years ago, I gave a core conversation at DrupalCon Chicago. It was the first ever core. Was that only two years ago? Uh, yeah. 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 Two, two years and two months. Or Man, that's a long two years. Um, <laughs> and it was the first time we had core conversations, and it was much less a uh, guy standing up in the front as it was a bunch of people arguing with me and it was really fun and really uh, exciting and so while I'm supposed to encourage people to run up to this mic to, to ask questions so that they can be recorded for posterity and I understand the importance of that I also uh, only have about 10 or 15 minutes of presentation and then would like to have the rest be um, discourse and yelling and throwing things. I think that would be really great. Um, so, um, you know, so feel free to walk up to the mic and feel free to just yell stuff out too and I'll just make sure that everybody's opinions get recorded for, um, for the video later um, unless they're really terrible. So, <laughs> right. So, um, so here we go. Core is big. Um, core is really big. You won't believe how vastly, hugely, and mind-boggling big <laughs> core has become. Not just in terms of code size, but in terms of the number of people working on it. Um, you, you know, the, the uh, processes and methods that we need to make core work when there are 50 core, div uh, core contributors sitting around a room in Antwerp is a lot different than when there are 1,500 core developers in a um, room in Munich, Germany, or as there will be this weekend, I believe 3,500 core developers. Um, and not even all of them are here. And they're not all core developers. I'm just talking about people. Um, I, maybe we can get them later, but the numbers are large, and they're much larger, th and they're much larger than they were five years ago. That's sort of the point. Things have become so large that even Larry can't code a whole subsystem by himself anymore. <laughs> um, and and um, that's that's really something. Um, so uh, you know. We, we started doing some things to address this, um, this scaling problem for the Drupal 8 cycle, and one of the things is that we named initiative leads to lead big projects for Drupal. And so there's myself and there's Larry, who's leading the web services initiative, and even that was too big for him, and so he spawned some of that off and uh, suckered Chris Vanderwater into taking on that part as the Scotch initiative, and then Gabor has been running the multilingual initiative, and uh, John Albon has been running the mobile initiative, and this was sort of a way to to insert, for lack of a better term, middle management into Drupal um, to, you know, take people to become essentially project managers for big stuff that's important to Drupal's future. But um, even, that, you know, by the time we got to the point of doing that, it was already not enough to insert that one small layer. Um, and by the time we started getting into really digging into some of these things, we already needed more people than just that. Um, this photo is from a code sprint that we held in Boston about a year and three months ago. It was February of last year. And already to start getting into decisions about how we wanted whiskey alone to look, we have three initiative leads in that photo, plus a gathering of about you know a half a dozen other core developers and the project leads of two major open source projects. <laughs> because uh, to the right of uh, Dries is Fabien Potencier, who's the leader of the Symphony Project, who flew to from France just to take part in this code sprint. Um, that's unbelievable. Um, so one of the things that happened later in um, the Drupal release cycle is that um, when we wanted to put views in core, they didn't have an initiative lead, they had an initiative team. Um, and that was actually really successful. Um, I wish we had all established initiative teams from the beginning. So we have um, Damian Cloep and Tim Plunkett and uh, Daniel Vayner and uh, XJM's shoe. So, um, so 
Um, I think that was really great, and I think that was a valuable lesson from um, the VIEWS team that, um, you know, even one person can't run a project anymore. They had a cross-functional team of people with mutual respect who could take on responsibilities as, people, as people's time or interest or wanting to choke each other ebbed and waned. And so um, that was one of, I think, one of the big learns of the Drupal 8 cycle, which is, is that teams work and that we can't have one person leading projects projects anymore, that, that we're already too big for that. We like grew too big for that before we even tried it. Um, and so um, I know that Shannon Vettis, who's been helping us a lot with uh, PMing for the, um, for the initiatives throughout the process, is giving a talk in this room tomorrow at 345. And uh, she's going to talk more about building teams about projects. And I urge everyone to go to that because it's super important. And it's um, something we're really going to have to think about in the next release cycle. So there's that. And then um, another thing that there was a lot of focus on around is that, you know, as core grows and, and people grow, um, those people need a way to work on core for more than just their spare time will allow because, as I said before, even Larry doesn't have enough spare time to code a, an entire subsystem anymore. And so that means funding development. And so there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of um, uh, innovation around funding models in this release cycle and I don't th and it's interesting because there wasn't really a focus on it it's not like there was a big you know thing where everyone said we have to think about funding for the Drupal 8 release cycle it just sort of happened out of necessity um, so you know we still had a lot of people who were sort of funded part-time by their jobs um, to work on core or could work on core in between projects and stuff like that but uh, we also had a lot of stuff like um, Acquia started their large-scale Drupal project to fund development uh, I made this big funding drive to fund development which was really successful and I hope can serve as a model for other people looking for stuff in the future. Um, um, the, um, there's been a lot more um, instances of a company sponsoring developers to go places to do things. Um, there's been more people getting hired full-time or part full-time with the intention of working on core and things like that. And um, I urge everyone to think more about funding because funding contribution is absolutely necessary for core to continue to grow. I've said it, I said it, people are probably sick of hearing me say this, but right now Drupal has all of the business pressures of a mature software project and none of the dedicated resources. Because if you want to build a configuration management system and you've got a software project, you hire a dev team and they build it. And we don't work that way. And But we need to figure out a way to work more that way if we want to be able to get more big things done in future versions of Drupal because um, in order to plan them and work them out, you need dedicated resources with predictable availability. And it's, and it's impossible to do anything in a timeline or milestones or anything like that if you don't have that. So funded contribution is absolutely necessary for Drupal to grow. Um, one of the things I heard a lot when I was um, fundraising was that um, people were reluctant to um, to give funding for something that they weren't going to be able to see for two to three years. Um, and that's a real problem because, you know, while you can make all sorts of ROI cases to people about why uh, the configuration management system is good for their business and why it's going to save them money and make them more competitive, if they, if they are working in a business which has, you know, somewhat tight returns and, um, and their margins are really thin, they don't have a lot of money to be contributing to something they're not going to get back on very quickly. Um, and that's, that's, and I adjusted by focusing on, on the kinds of people who had longer development models, on people who are more product-based and more competitive industries who, who um, can see longer-term investments pay off better. Um, but um, that's actually a big problem because a lot of the people, places where the real money is in Drupal right now, especially at the big media companies and the services agencies, are, are they, they, they're not really able to invest that much in stuff that they're going to see so far out. Um, and so um, that, that had me started thinking a little bit about our release cycles. And that's sort of where I wanted to talk about some today. Um, but in addition to having it be a problem with funding, um, there's, there's another really, really big problem with our release cycle right now. And I think it's very well, um, um, I, I, heard, I heard a quote from uh, somebody on a call that we had that really shoved this point home for me. Um, oh, that's, okay, that's the wrong slide. I already talked about that. Um, here's the other quote. I think I'm burnt out. 
I'm literally losing sleep over this problem, and I'm too stubborn to care about my own feelings because I know I'm going to have to live with this for the next three years. That's um, Eclipse GC Chris Vanderwater talking on one of our initiative lead calls about a technical problem that he was having a great deal of trouble um, convincing other people to get into core. Um, and one of the reasons that um, that I, th I think we have a lot of burnout in the core community and we have a lot of sort of bike shedding and stuff hitting walls in issues is because of this. It's because people know that they're going to have to live with whatever we build here for three to six years, that we're not going to be able to iterate on it, that we can't just get something in that's good enough and work with it and, and see how it, it grows in the real world. We have to get it in and it has to be right because we're going to be stuck. And that's a real big problem. Um, it's if, as a community who needs people to be able to, you know, keep being refreshed on working with core and feeling like they're making progress um, and feel like, you know, their mistakes aren't so final. Um, it's 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 really contributes a lot to the pressure that we have. Um, but on the other hand, the three the three to four year release cycle is super important because it provides the long term stability that enterprise clients want. It's been a reason, one of the big reasons that Drupal's been that has been adopted so widely because they can install and and uh, and build a site and know that it's going to be supported for at least five to six years. Um, and so uh, just saying we are going to move to a 12-month release cycle and we can break whatever APIs we want to in that 12-month release cycle probably isn't going to fly very well. It's really hard for product-based companies. It's really hard for companies doing large implementations of Drupal. Um, it's, it's difficult in a lot of ways, and I think it would hurt our adoption rate significantly if we did that. So um, I've, I've had some ideas that I've started to think about about, re about release cycles, um, and I'm going to talk about one of them here. It's not a proposal. It's just sort of some stuff that's been floating around in my brain, and I encourage any other people to come up with ideas and stuff around this or start talking about it here today because, you know, this, isn't the, kind, this is the kind of thing that's big enough that, I can't, that you can't just throw a proposal out and convince people of it. It's a thing that sort of consensus has to be arrived at as a community, and I'm sure that there's technical stuff that I haven't thought through nearly enough here. So, uh, so I'm going to throw out some ideas and then we can start talking. And if you want to talk about that or about other stuff, uh, about how we can grow and maintain core development well, that's great. Uh, I highly encourage it. So, um, so this is our current, like, let's look at Drupal 9. So we know that we can't throw out a, a stable release cycle because we need it to keep companies adopting Drupal and growing with it and getting in place. So we, should, we have to keep that. And I think it makes sense too because there are a lot of stuff that takes a really long time to build. Um, for instance, you know, rewriting the entire routing system is something that is going to break everything in core. It takes a long time to do. It takes a long time to convert everything. And so that's the kind of thing that's well suited for a very long release cycle. So it makes sense to keep that in some way, shape, or form. But one thing we can start doing is layering shorter release cycles on top of it um, and starting to be a little more aggressive about the kind of things that we build into interim versions of Drupal. Um, one of the things that we're really reluctant to do is to add major features in the middle of release cycles. There are some reasonably good reasons for that. One of the reasons is because, um, for instance, let's say that we took um, standard tables in the mi middle of a version of Drupal and made them responsive by default out of the box in the middle of a major version of Drupal. That seems like a really good feature to add, but one of the things that it does is it, is it, is it changes our UI components all over the place. And that, for the way that Drupal is right now, is actually technically an API break because so much of our um, ability to add functionality into Drupal is focused on page and form alters. And if you change the, the format of those or the way that they're arranged, then you're going to break um, contributed modules. Um, I think it's worth having the discussion about whether or not we care about that. Um, if, because, 
because the ability to add major features mid version of Drupal is really important. And if we start breaking those kinds of APIs, then maybe we, it'll, it'll encourage us to start war, uh, building a system that isn't so tightly coupled to the way that our layouts work and start building real APIs on top of that instead of pretending that form arrays are APIs. So I think that's something that would be really important to do. Um, we could also start building um, API breaking features into Drupal mid-release if we provide backwards compatibility. That would be something, obviously, that we've trended not to do in the past. But uh, I, again, I think it's worth considering in certain cases because uh, of all of the benefits that we've discussed here. And obviously, in some cases, that's really difficult because there's always that balance between backwards compatibility and performance. And it's impossible to provide backwards compatibility and not impact performance. We're already impacting performance pretty heavily in Drupal 8, no matter what happens uh, right now. So, um, and, but on the other hand, um, as we decouple Drupal more and make more stuff pluggable, providing backwards compatibility in, uh, in an area is going to become more easy. And so um, I think that's something we should really start thinking about and reconsidering um, in mid-release cycles. And then, of course, um, in between those release cycles, we can release our, our normal bug fix and uh, security releases as we do already, and they just become minor releases rather than major releases. Um, if we really wanted to, we could also fix our numbering system so that uh, Drupal 8.1 and 8.10 weren't technically the same release. Um, I think that would be great, but I'm just nitpicking at that point. Um, I think that a release cycle like this has a lot of appeal. I mean, I was thinking about, for instance, how we could start working. One of the things about um, building new APIs is that it's really difficult to understand how they're going to work until you start using them. Uh, we actually re-architected CMI essentially twice during the release cycle because as we did implementations, we started learning a lot about core uh, use, use cases that we hadn't considered and we started seeing ways that we could provide abstraction that made more sense than others and we started realizing that, you know, multilingual is really difficult and stuff like that. And so um, getting something in place, even if it's only for contrib to use, if core is not using it, I think is something that's worth discussing. Doing things like, for instance, we could, have had, we could have provided CMI that wrote to CMI, but also to the variables table, so that you have a situation where um, we're still using the variables table as canonical, but if you want to start experimenting with CMI, um, there's some stuff there in core that's using it, stuff like that. It may be a dumb idea, but it's something to think about. Um, how we can make a cycle like this work is, I think, um, really important to our future. And I would like to start talking about that and uh, other topics that I brought up. And that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, if people want to uh, shoot me down or come up with other ideas and talk about things and then maybe come up with sort of breakout plans that we can start uh, throwing at Dries and the other core committers, uh, please feel free. Uh, the mic is right there. Go. <laughs> Gabor. Yes. Hey. So I think I think uh, the mobile ecosystems gave us a very good example recently. Uh, so Google just had their huge keynote last week, and everybody expected them to release their brand new shiny Android OS, and they didn't release their brand new shiny Android OS. They released a whole set of great updates that run all of the shiny Android OSs on the world. So I think what so I think there, I, I see a parallel there that we that we that Drupal is really suited more for the Android model, where we have all kinds of distributions and all all the sites that run Drupal are distributions in themselves because they have custom modules and mm -hmm. themes and they are forks essentially of Drupal. We right. Could, we could I guess say that in an extreme. So we would we would need to figure out a way to put stuff on top and and follow more like the Android model. Mm -hmm. But what we do instead is we put more and more features into core. So when we want to actually update those features, we'll only be able to follow the Apple model where we need to release a whole new OS to e update our maps or update our email software, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I mean, that comes to the core of one of the great debates in the Drupal world for the last five years, of yeah, course. Yeah, the small um, core stuff. The small core yeah. stuff, and it does it make sense for Drupal to be useful out of the box or not? Because of course, Drupal 8 is the first release, I think, ever that is really useful out of the box for anything, but of course, it comes at a price, as you're discussing. Yeah, but what, so what Android does well is when you get an Android phone, it has a lot of stuff. Right. At, if, especially if you get a Samsung phone or an HTC or whatever, it has even more crap stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you don't think about it as a distribution of Android, it's, it's Android. But you're getting a lot of stuff. And then, and then Google can still update, update all the goodies without, without even others involved in there. Right. So I, think, so I think we have very good proof around that this model works very well. Mm -hmm. So I think we might, we might be able to use this to argument our way into this somehow. I think, uh, I think that's... I mean, you know, because there's been a lot of talk about how Drupal itself should be a distribution of the Drupal platform with a bunch of default modules enabled and stuff like that, right? And uh, people have been saying that for a long time. Um, I mean, it does start to come at a little bit of a price. I mean, one of the things that happens in the Android world, for instance, is that there are a lot of phones that call themselves Android phones, but they have vastly varying differences in functionality because the, uh, the cell phone providers uh, do so much customization and bling on top of them that they can't easily be updated when new versions of Android get released. And so it's really frustrating for people who have Android phones and see people with Nexuses with all this cool new stuff, but their providers haven't updated for the new stuff, right? And that kind of market fragmentation, it's funny because people say that Android has such a huge percentage of the market, but I would argue there is no Android because all of the phones outside of the Google phones are so highly customized that they don't even really resemble what Android is anymore. And I think that's something that we would have to think about in that kind of a model and really consider. Um, but on the other hand, we could just as easily say, if you want all of the new stuff early, just use Drupal and then, you know, just like, because that's essentially what Google's saying with the Nexus devices and, uh, and then, you know, that's your problem. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot to talk about there. Larry. So, plus one. Um, the, uh, on the release cycle, um, a ton of the changes that have gone into Drupal 8 have been specifically so that we can do this kind of thing. It's not been something we've been discussing explicitly, but, you know, good OO separations, everything Mark was talking about in the last session about, you know, separated, you know, good domain models, good architecture lets you do exactly that without breaking APIs. I think the important thing there that we have to understand is um, big nested arrays are not an API. If you want to think about things in this way, big nested arrays need to die because those are not an API. Any, you, know, you sneeze, that you break that API. And that's why we've been so paranoid about breaking backward compatibility to date. So the cultural shift that we have been making needs to continue further and faster for us to pull off something like that, although I do fully support it. Um, Second point earlier on, I think the the biggest thing core miss is missing right now, development-wise, is predictable resources. Whether that's you know you and me as initiative leads, whether that's you know developers like you know Effulgencia, who's just paid he know he has 40 hours a week to work on core or whatever it is, um, just being able to predict where no we're going to have this many hours of time to throw at problem X. Be in this time frame is the single biggest thing that is missing from being able to actually manage core in some worthwhile fashion right now. I know as an initiative lead myself, anytime I sit down to do anything, I'm torn between do I try and write something? Do I try and review something so that someone else can get stuff done? Or do I try and you know, write documentation so that someone else can write something else? Whichever one of these I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing it in spare time where it's a little bit of time and I'm shortchanging all of the others. That's just terrible for everyone involved, especially me, but everyone else too. So that's the problem we do need to solve. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think all of the initiative leads have said the same thing at this point. You know, Views is the only initiative that got that right mm -hmm. um, with a fixed core team of multiple people who had guaranteed minimum of time that they could put towards it. Mm -hmm. and we all need to be doing that. And it's hard because even, even when we have a, a fixed time, a lot of our resources don't. So for instance, somebody will come into CMI and say, oh, I really want to help out. And then it turns out they only have two weeks to help out and then another project starts and then I've got to re, and then I've got to re onboard some brand new person into a complex project. I think that long term, 
uh, the answer to this is for people to just get jobs at places that rely on Drupal. For instance, um, I know that I know that uh, Jared Smith from Bluehost is over here, and they're hiring people right now to just work on WordPress, for instance, because so much of their business relies on a stable WordPress, and so it's in their benefit to have WordPress in place. Um, and so, I mean, you know, they're a hosting provider. Let's not pretend that they don't have an incredibly large number of WordPress sites running on there. Um, you know, and to convince uh, companies that rely on Drupal, either in the hosting space, or the training space, or the services space, and et cetera, to, to hire people full time to work on Drupal is, I think, an incredibly important thing that we have to try and figure out how to do uh, down the road. Add on to that um, something sl slightly more controversial. There are times when fewer people are better. Uh, something I've said since the beginning of the Whiskey Initiative, give me five people 10 hours a week for a year, I can do whatever you want. Yep. Give me 50 people one hour a week, but not every week for right. a year, I can do jack all. Yep. And that's another problem we need to solve, not just funding, but also just culturally. The idea that... One person managing the 50 people, or three people managing them, and then, then it's usually that's, uh, and it's not convinced of that. In some cases, yes, but not in an awful lot of them. You and I are going to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to talk about anything that impacts our ability to grow sustainably here. So, um, I was encouraged to hear your idea about the revision uh, release cycles. And um, I'm in favor of breaking APIs as long as uh, the, the module uh, maintainers actually keeps track of all that. And so maybe an overarching project manager that keeps track of all that stuff and then it filters down to the module maintainers. And it's a good thing there aren't very many of those. And, um, <laughs> and to combine... 1,000 contributed modules, isn't that the number? To combine the idea about the teamwork, um, I'm really excited about that. I think it's a great thing. Um, so maybe the module maintainers, instead of actually writing code, they would manage a sub team for that to, to so APIs won't break in their in their module. So it's just an idea. Yeah, um, I mean um, another thing is to is to have, you know, we could start using deprecated a lot more, for instance, um, and laying new APIs alongside existing APIs. Um, but uh, you know, we're still going to have the problem at some point of, you know. I think we have to start considering the impact of API breaks too, because some API breaks just aren't going to have as wide an impact as others and may be worth doing, you know. It's not hard for us to grep through the code base to find what people are doing. I broke, I removed an alter hook in, in Drupal 8, hook image styles alter, because nobody in all of the 25,000 contrib modules was using it. And so I was like, well, I guess this probably isn't that useful. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to notice. <laughs> There's probably someone here whose entire website relies on hook image styles alter is now going to cost me after this. So, Jess. Yeah, so I guess two things. Um, the, the one thing that I was thinking about um, when you were talking about, I, I'm in favor also of finding a way to provide backwards compatibility, but like you said, performance is always a concern. Um, and the idea that occurred to me just now is that maybe, maybe we need to maintain two branches. Maybe we need to have the press flow-ish kind of branch that's only focused on you know, the, the stable public API that does not provide the new features, and then we have the option to, to add, add new APIs that are wrapped in that BC layer. I have, that could be an absolute nightmare to maintain, and I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't see, like, I, I'm, I'd be very concerned, I mean, unless we, I mean, that or we'd have to be very, very sure to do, you know, performance testing in actual real use cases. Mm -hmm. And then my, well, I'll wait my turn for the other thing. Can we comment the code oh. fork ourselves in it? <laughs> I will say, yeah, well, I will say, Larry, are you coming to the, to Kath, the core conversation Kathy and I are doing tomorrow morning? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting him on the spot on the <laughs> microphone here on <laughs> purpose. Yeah, scheduling conflict, actually, oh, son of a bitch. I'm going to, okay. <laughs> We're going to talk. Klaus? Uh, in terms of uh, main forking, uh, the Linux kernel does sort of that, although they generally don't break APIs to as my knowledge, but there's what the every three months we add major features if we want to, and then there's at least two major versions that are long-term supported. Uh, that's not what I came up here though. I, I wish I had something really clever to say that would solve all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, but I came up here because I feel like what 
uh, what you, Greg, and Larry were talking about. I mean, that's uh, I've been I was helping you out a little bit with a few patches here and there for CMI. I've been involved a bit in whiskey and doing a little bit of work, but I, but not anything consistent. And I see, of course, that that's I mean, potentially it's even uh, it's even negative because I take up right. all of your time when you could be doing something uh, instead of explaining to me what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I would love for my employer to pay me to work half time or full time or whatever on on Drupal. That would be great. Did I uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can work something out. Uh, but how do I convince my employer to do that is is the question that I'm I think one of the things that I've uh, I've been maintaining for a long time is that because we're um, we're nerds and we lack self confidence in in stuff because you know there's there's this thing called the Dunning Kruger syndrome. Uh, it's a defined psychological thing, and basically it says that the more competent you are at something, the less competent you think you are at something. And so um, everybody in this room is incredibly competent, and we probably all think we suck because everybody else in this room is more competent than we are. And one of the things that I've been maintaining for a long time is that employers will provide time to work on Drupal if all of the developers insist on it because we are the limited resource in the supply and demand chain in the Drupal world. And so if nobody goes to work for anybody who doesn't provide time, then they'll have to provide time or they can't get us to work for them. Uh, you have to insist on it. And, and I kind of, I want to be, I, every, time, every time I talk to people about this, I want to be like Norma Ray with the big, you know, <laughs> with the big banner standing on the table. But it's true. It's super important for people who are working in the Drupal community. I mean, we are in so high demand, it is ridiculous for any of us to be working in a job where we're not completely happy. <laughs> That's what I had to say about that. Thank you. I'm going to zero in on your comment about versioning. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pretty popular uh, mechanism to do versioning in, in Java and other communities. Even comment was made about the Linux kernel where you've got a major minor mm -hmm. and sort of like a build number or a break fix or a security patch um, plus one. I would love to, I, and I think I, it's I really. Think we need to get to that. Yeah, I think it's really important for us to look at other models that other open source projects are using successfully. So Java uses yeah. Maven a mm -hmm. lot for build. Mm -hmm. That's built into their versioning process within the Java community if you're using Maven, which I don't know anyone who isn't. <laughs> um, PHP version, three, three positions. Now they kind of leave it up a little bit to your interpretation of what those positions are, which we kind of need that. We need to be able to interpret what's a major, minor, and build. Right. Um, so I'm just going to zero in on that one comment and uh, leave it there. Cool. Thanks. Two quick comments, Greg. First of all, uh, versioned APIs. I think it might be interesting to look at more, more formally saying, hey, this version of Drupal has version X of this API and version X plus one of this mm -hmm. API, and modules themselves saying, hey, I'm, I'm expecting to find version X of, uh, of this API. That's what I'm coded against. If that version goes away in core, I know as a module, hey, you know, it's right, going to work. Right, right, yeah. The, the idea is, to just clarify, it's, it's that you don't have the Drupal 8 version of API X. You have the, each API has its own, has its own separate, separate number. Okay. And that's similar to sort of what uh, the um, what the views guys have been doing for a long time because they provide that function that provides the API number that views Correct. has, and then you have to be compatible with a specific yeah, I, I API number. I would love to see that sort of thing more widely adopted within within Core and within the. I think that would be a really interesting idea to explore. Yeah. S second thing is from a from a funding standpoint, um, you know, you talked about one of the things we did was try to go out and help with the CMI initiative. Mm -hmm. I would love it. Uh, you know, if we would continue to, to push that cause, um, you know, from a from our standpoint, from a business perspective, it was really nice to have these core initiatives to say, hey, this is what our funding is working on, and to be able to go to business decision makers and saying, this is going to help us because of X, Y, and Z. This is what they're working on. So kudos for the, the core initiatives and, and bringing kind of more, you know, insight and in, and in, in marketing, for lack of a better term, to mm -hmm. the to the initiatives that that are being worked on. I think that will continue to help get cool. funding. And thank you for your help. Bluehost uh, was one of the major funders of the CMI initiative. And, and, and did I mention that we're hiring? And Bluehost is hiring, so talk to Jared Smith afterwards if you're looking for a job. Um, 
So with great project, we also need great tools and something, as somebody who's one of the long tail core people who is passionate about certain issues and not others, um, it's when I work with other open source projects, I get jealous about their man tools for managing milestoning, et cetera. And while I think we've collectively saved billions of seconds just by adding the subscribe button to D.O, it might be a good uh, in, in looking for making uh, development more sustainable, it might be good to do some discovery about what additional tools do we need to uh, introduce to manage things like issue queues, milestoning, and things like that. There's a core conversation about that. Yes. There's a core conversation by Gabor about, uh, about um, tooling up for uh, running uh, initiatives and improving our tools on Drupal.org. Um, and so I encourage you to talk to him. Um, that's a very controversial t topic in the Drupal world now, of course, because in order, because just like Drupal projects, in order to improve Drupal.org projects, we need funding and people to work on them and things like that. And um, and you know, um, traditionally, our our history with doing that is not the best. So, um, but I think I, but I, that's not to say I don't agree with you. I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. I think the short answer to that is it's a meta level on top of our initiatives. So we want to work on core stuff and we suffer because we don't have good tools. So we can go one meta level up, but then we don't work on our core stuff. Right. So we have deadlines for our core stuff, so we want to work on that. So it's very hard to find the balance between working on the meta level and, 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 the, and the level that we were supposed to work on. Right, and it's really hard because we're constantly putting out fires and we never sort of take a step back to see the trees and the things that cause those fires and sort of put all that aside and work on the stuff that will make us, you know, we, we, the long-term view. It's really hard to find sometimes. Yes. I uh, work for a college that has been using Drupal since uh, 2006 now, and I came in on the ground floor of it and have been doing all of the uh, incremental upgrades to the various versions. and. Uh, I'm very pleased that you're finally, that there's finally some talk about the way that versioning works, uh, mostly because this last time around, going from D6 to D7, took us, I'm estimating, three person years to accomplish. We have about 250,000 lines of code, and actually doing that, that whole process, is uh, getting very, very difficult to justify to our CIO. And it's really starting to get to the point where we may not be able to go to D8 simply because we can't afford to. Um, and if there were to be more incremental upgrades or uh, a fork or what have you, something, that ha something has to change. It really can't, it, it can't be uh, that we need to spend three years doing this again. Mm -hmm. It's simply not going to work for us. And that's, and that's an interesting thing that I hadn't really thought about, which is that, you know, breaking APIs in the middle of a release cycle sort of spreads that pain out. It does, and I think that may actually be, be useful because we can say to our CIO, well, you know, they're coming out with a new version and this API changes, so it's going to take us, you know, another three weeks to get this version up. And we can, we can justify that more easily than we mm -hmm. can, saying it has to all happen at yeah. once. Oh, that's a great, that's a great comment. Yeah, thanks. Um, going back to the point about resources, since Larry's not going to be at my conversation tomorrow. Um, uh, so uh, I, I will agree, um, it's definitely very, very valuable to have uh, a, a team of developers who has a committed amount of time every week. That's what made VDC work, is that the four of us, each of us had like two days every week for eight months to work on views, and that was amazing. We could trust each other, we all knew what was going on, and that's incredible. But on the other hand, um, we as a community have a resources problem in terms, of, in terms of talent working on core. And you can't, we, not you specifically, but we can't afford not to invest in those 50, hour, those 50 people who have one hour. Because if we don't invest in those 50 people who have one hour, they will not become the people who end up getting paid by their companies to work two full days to work on your play core. Because it, you, just, you just have to give someone a little, and it, it's a numbers game. We see, we see this in the core mentoring program where we, we help 100 people. And out of those 100 people, a lot of them will never come back. They work on one or two patches, and some of them don't even really enjoy it. And some come back week after week. But then there's like that 1% that make the leap and become core contributors who are passionate about it, who work all the time, who go from being just participants to mentoring other people. And that's, that's the reason we can't afford not to invest in those people. So I, I agree that an individual initiative lead trying to project manage and architect and all these things can't manage those 50 people in that one hour, and on the other hand, though, you have, to be, you have to find a way to include them in your process, let them, give them a chance to make the mistakes, 
there, you're still, if you still have someone to review their code and, and say, okay, no, actually, this is not a good idea, someone who's not you, then it's okay, and then you have a way to mitigate the time. But you need to be able, willing to invest just, just a little bit of time. Well, that's one of the things that having a team makes easier. When you're just one person, yeah. it becomes really difficult to scale that up. But when you've got two people who can still focus on building things yes, over here, exactly. and two people who can focus on helping exactly. people out over here, and then when these people get burned out, switch off and stuff like that, it makes all of that stuff so much more easier. And that's one of the things that pe like me and Larry have talked about a lot, mm -hmm. is that we're constantly having to like weigh our priorities, even though we know that helping people and mentoring will help us long term. In the short term, we've got like five like issue fires over here right. that we have to put out and pay attention to. And that whole thing is, is the same as Gabor's thing, right? It's like when you, when you only have enough people to do exactly what you absolutely have to, it's, in, it's impossible, it's impossible yeah. to, to scale out to the point where you can grow sustainably. But so. on the other hand, in the, past, in the past year actually, we've built a community of people whose primary interest in Drupal is, is mentoring other people to work specifically on core. Um, a year ago at DrupalCon Denver, six of us decided that we were gonna do a sprint that was like core office hours in real life, and we had three times as many people show up to it as we wanted, and there was a huge demand. Six people, at this sprint we have over 40 people signed up to do that. So there is a resource you can take advantage of. It's not all on you to figure out how to work with those people, and that's just what I wanna reiterate. If you can spare an hour to talk to the person who can spare eight hours, that will make a big difference. And I'm done now. But come to our core conversation tomorrow. And uh, that's totally true. The growth of the core mentoring group in the last year has been absolutely stunning. Uh, it's, it's been really amazing, and I think it's a really good thing to see going forward for the Drupal community. So, yes. So I work for a company that outsources all our Drupal work. So all we can really do is give money. Um, but we need help. I need help selling that to management because management, management doesn't even understand software development, let alone open source. Uh, we looked at large-scale Drupal, and it was just too big a leap for a first time in. Who can help me present it to management and explain it in better terms than it's, it's good karma, it's the right thing to do, somewhere down the line, this will help us? Mm -hmm. I actually think, well, first of all, I actually, um, even though you may not be able to get into the large-scale Drupal program, I would assume that, I don't want to speak for Michael here, but I would assume that he has plenty of resources he could provide to you um, on, on selling open source to big companies, because that's what he does for a living. And so um, he has all sorts of white papers and stuff like that. But on a more concrete level, what I would find is something that um, actively costs your company money, um, and then look to support um, whatever initiative is fixing that. And so like for instance, when I was looking for support for CMI, um, I would go to service providers and I would say, I want you to sit down and estimate how much time it takes you to deal with features and update hooks and all of this stuff. And imagine taking all of that off of your bottom line and give me a small piece of it. Um, because, I mean, it would, it's, in a lot of projects, it's like 10 to 15% of their estimate is dealing with this stuff. And it will make them more competitive and give them more, um, and give them more you know, leeway. It will make their margins greater and stuff like that. So um, every, every, everybody has pain points, mm -hmm. and, and everybody has people who want to fix those pain points. And I think the most important thing is to find the ROI arguments to put those people together. And that's what I would really do, because that's where the most compelling arguments are going to come. Well, well, here's my pain point. It's 30 different vendors of very poor quality s building bad Drupal sites. What's, what's my, what, what can I use, what can I point at in a Drupal initiative to say this will help? Um, well, one of the things you could point at probably yes, is Yes, please. I'll take, I'll take all of your cards at this point. Um, well, the thing that the thing that usually I would point at there is finding um, uh, vendors of higher quality. Of we're, course, we're they're also of higher cost. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind the cost because you pay yeah. the cost anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I I don't have I don't have a big answer to that other okay. than supporting training programs 
and documentation programs, which will grow more Drupal developers than we have right now. Because I think that one of the reasons that a lot of people get stuck um, using low quality Drupal developers is that there are so few high quality Drupal developers right now. And so um, focusing on initiatives that will grow training and documentation and the kind of things that will scale um, the community mm -hmm. of good developers is I think something that you might want to think about. Okay, great, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I took notes while I was in line. <laughs> okay, so the problem of poor quality Drupal developers and your subcontractors, if you're looking for ways to fix that problem and find funding for that, um, I don't know how you can pitch it, but if you require your subcontractors to require that their Drupal developers contribute to core a certain number of hours per week, the core community will train them to improve them. We don't let people contribute to issues and make patches without giving them the feedback in a way that improves them so their future work is better. Um, uh, the, when we were talking about teams for initiatives and how to build that team, uh, I may propose that one of the people in the team uh, be a mentor specifically specializing in that initiative to relieve the other people that are part of that team that find mentoring frustrating. Um, there are people that can do that and not in a general core because the core pool is so big now that we can find people to be part of initiatives specifically to do that for them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yeah, building teams that are cross-functional is super important uh, because no team can run 30 people with just like four hardcore devs running it. That doesn't work <laughs> that way. And then we were talking about how to pitch to companies to pay us to work on core. And one aspect of that can be that when, so I got hired to work on core um, 10 hours a week and then I blog about me working on core five hours a week and I get paid to do that. And what m one of the things that my company gets out of that is they are able, I think, to hire more Drupal developers and better Drupal developers because Drupal developers want to work for companies that do that. So it's like a recursive kind of a thing. So if a company wants to have good staff, the way they get it is to pay their current staff to work on core so that the person they haven't hired yet wants to come and work for them. And so it's, you don't have to revolt exactly. <laughs> Although I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Alex. All right. um, no, really I, oh, by the way, I just want to point out, I think Dries's keynote's at 11.30, and it's 11.05 right now. So I'm happy to stay here as long as people want, but I just wanted, I also want to see Dries's keynote, so I'll probably have wrap up in like 10 minutes. Okay. Um, really great ideas here, and I'm thrilled uh, that there's been so much support so far for the um, kind of the major release cycles, uh, long major release cycles with minor improvements along mm -hmm. the way. I also agree with what Larry said about a lot of the object orientation that's gone into Drupal 8 kind of sets us up to be able to do that a lot easier than we've been able to in the past. Um, the other thing I want to sort of point out though is that the, the things that aren't like strict APIs like hook form alter or hook node view alter or a lot of our alter hooks are the things that actually make Drupal awesome. And that a lot of people who started developing for Drupal and making really cool contrib modules, making cool distributions, making cool uh, themes, making cool custom websites, you know, that's what they love about Drupal is that you can alter everything. Yeah. And I would, I would argue that a Drupal without alter hooks is actually not Drupal anymore. Right. Uh, so, but I think a way that through that is to, is, to, uh, is to think of minor releases as an opportunity to allow, allow breaks of those things, right? So you keep your, your nice object oriented APIs, you know, backwards compatible, but you allow certain BC breaks in the, in, in those kinds of things. And, um, you know, and they're smaller and they're more manageable. And as someone said, you know, like if they come at certain, you know, intervals where that are predictable, that, that are predictable, mm -hmm. and that people can keep up with them. One of the interesting things that that causes, though, is it means that, right, there are going to be websites, for example, that don't update from 8.1 to 8.2 right away, or from 8.2 to 8.3, because they, you know, some of their custom yeah. modules will break, some of the contrib modules they they're using will need time. 
which means for a period of time we're going to be need to, needing to support security updates yeah. for multiple miners. Um, maybe we've gotten to a scale of community size here that we can do that, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to sort of point those things out. The security team still needs more people. The security team is always under-resourced. So yeah. yes, that's, well, that's actually one of the pain points. If we can find a way to get more resources in the security team, that might be able to support this kind of plan. It's a very direct thing if you have someone pay you to work on four or four part-time in your job. You can tell your employer, three, three hours a week to work on the security team. And the security team would love that, but because you're doing something very direct, it gives you a very direct return on investments. Because you're getting more secure system on it, there's a, a nice good target. Yeah, I mean, the cost, the cost of having to save your site when it gets hacked versus the cost of giving somebody a little bit of time to run on the security team is like, there, boy, that's a strong ROI argument right it's there. several orders of magnitude difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Hi. Hi, um, Mike Gifford, uh, Accessibility Maintainer. All right. Um, looking at, at uh, the, the idea of culture change and the importance of culture change for sustainability, not necessarily the culture change of the Drupal participants and Drupal shops. Certainly the Drupal shops who are here, most of them get that. But it's a culture change with our clients and with the, um, the, the, the people who are implementing Drupal but don't really get Drupal, the people who aren't here, and realizing that, that the only reason they can use the software, and it's what, you know, Drupal Core is, re is rated at $14 million if you were to go off and develop it from scratch today. So you're getting $14 million of worth of software for free. How about you contribute a little bit, even you know a couple hundred dollars or a portion of the budget, or have something so that there's a regular way to go off and to contribute, not just a core, but also the contributed modules, to have some way to make it easier for the clients to give directly, not necessarily to their Drupal shop. And as a Drupal shop, I, ref I definitely want them to go off and to give to me. But, but as a, uh, you know, I want my clients to go off and pay me. But I also want them to go off and realize that that there's some stuff that you know I, I'm not the maintainer of a bunch of modules. I don't do a lot of different stuff. But but there's if they can find ways to support the functionality that they need and that's useful that is, like right now there's no way to, to give directly to those initiatives that matter to you as, a, as an organization. Um, you can go and hire a Drupal shop that believes in these issues and, and support it, but there's no way to, to do that. Um, when uh, we were, were hiring to go off and to bring, or we were, sorry, not hiring, when we were fundraising to try and bring Vincenzo here to, to, uh, to DrupalCon, um, it was, you know, all of the money that came in with some minor, like 90, 95, 96% of the money that came in was from Drupal, from the Drupal community who were bringing Vincenzo to come here. Mm -hmm. It wasn't from government, it wasn't from university, it wasn't from the organizations like the NFB that are, are using Drupal. Like there's a lot of people in the accessibility community that are using Drupal. They didn't give. The Drupal community did. The people who are here gave to make sure that Vincenzo could come. So we get it. But how do we create the culture change so the people outside of here are able to go off and understand, I mean, beyond Drupal gives, beyond that sort of sense of, here's that sense of pride and we'll point some links to you and sort of highlight those people, but sort of make it clear that part of Drupal, part of this wealth of, of software is also that that is a mindset change that is different from any other software. I, I don't really know. I mean, it's hard. I mean, one of the things that I've thought about a lot is the possibility of us setting up, like for instance, Mozilla has a nonprofit that manages all of the money that gives, that they give to their developers, and uh, and I think and and then we would have a central agency that would go out and um, you know do marketing and PR around 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 raising money for core development. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an interesting model, but I also know that Dries has been really resistant to it. And of course, we have the DA now, but they're completely uh, banned, essentially, from funding any core development directly. Right. Um, they have to, um, they have to uh, fund infrastructure and cons and stuff like that. And um, you know, it's it's really hard because we, as a community, have grown very distrustful of centralization, mm -hmm. um, and and. Um, and a lot of other open source projects are funded by commercial entities, um, you know, like uh, the Google projects and Oracle projects and and uh, MongoDB and Ubuntu and all of this stuff, uh, you know, Canonical, Symphony. Yeah, Symphony, that's right. Um, Canonical has 150 developers that they pay to work on Ubuntu, yeah. you know. Um, and so um, we as a community are, are distrustful of centralization, which makes the problem that you're talking about much more difficult. Right. Um, and, and so I don't have a really good answer for that. 
uh, right. really, but obviously it's important to talk about. <laughs> Even if we can have diversified ways of people giving money, either yeah, say, yeah. you know, a flatterer link on, on pages or on issues for people to go off and, you know, I think we could get a lot more people contributing to Drupal Core if, it, if they could even get pizza money once a month. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if for the hundreds of hours that they're contributing, if they could go to their, go to their partner and say, hey, it's, it's beer and pizza tonight on Drupal, great stuff. Like, it would be <laughs> so much easier to go off and get people involved. Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing right now except right, for right. geek cred, which is, Mm -hmm. which only goes so far if your boss isn't paying you to do it. Right, sure. No, no, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So I do have an answer for that. Um, my name is Ben Melanson of Agaric. Um, and the, like the last four Drupal cons, um, especially Ali Mika of Advantage Labs and I have put together, you know, a boff on discussing ways that the community can support community projects. And so we have that BOF coming up again Thursday at noon um, in A104. But what I really wanted to do was, and it, it, this is a key part of that I feel, is even though this is a core conversation, to remind that um, Drupal, uh, more than other projects, really lives on a really, really, really healthy contrib space. Um, and that we don't need enlightened self-interest from the shops and companies using Drupal. We just need to help them act in their own self-interest. And that if we can come up with ways that, you know, when there's 50 libraries that need something or there's, you know, 100 development shops that all have the same need to actually coordinate and make that need happen, this this is not happening, and if that happens, then we have sort of a practice for how to do the same thing on the core level. So I would really love to see more thought at how we make things bubble up, because yes, it's hard to make the case, work on something that's going to benefit you in three years, but we're not even getting people to collaborate on things that would benefit them in three months if they right. would just do that collaboration. So I really feel if we can nail it on the more immediate, more local, more small level, and so that addresses the, the fear of centralization and it actually like gives us a chance to build up this ecosystem of, oh wow, if I contribute help either, you know, so fund it or have developers do it, all these various ways we're talking about, but do it on a lot more smaller scale um, contrib projects and then it'll bubble up in the core. I think that's a great idea and I encourage anyone to join that boff and discuss it. Uh, it's 11.14. I'm going to have to give Alex the last voice at the mic here um, so that we can all get off and, and watch Dries show us lots of pretty graphs. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be really quick. Um, okay. First up, Greg, thank you for bringing me into Core Dev. <laughs> I had to say that, uh, that uh, you know, it's interesting because people talk about mentorship and stuff like that. And it's like, I, I, gave, a court, I gave a conversation at DrupalCon Chicago um, called A Shot in the Arm, and it's about how just, just doing little things to support people can push them off into, into great directions. And um, seeing Alex grow from, uh, from sitting down at my table at Denver to a core maintainer in a year has been really amazing. <laughs> so Teams plus one, like working with you, wow. Um, but <laughs> the, the other interesting thing is about conflict of interest. As core development becomes more professional, more supported by companies, we're going to have conflicts of interest, and I don't know how we're going to deal with it. Because right now, if I go and get employed, I'm not employed. <laughs> I'm employed, <laughs> um, If I got a job, and I start committing patches that are in their interest, who knows? It's difficult. Well, we already do have conflict of interest indirectly, because people are scratching their own itches through their companies. Like, that's how a lot of I mean, it's not just people giving up their evening yeah. Uh, I just want to say, I've only been a developer in Drupal for two years, but I've been in PHP for about 10. And uh, the market is moving in a direction where software updates generally are pushing even, and you know nothing about it. You just get it and you know that everything will continue to work. So I think that uh, the market is telling us what we have to do is that uh, updates need to be incremental, rapid, and immediate, and uh, the slow, long uh, mm -hmm. cycle is definitely out of Cool. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Please, let's continue these conversations, not just this week, but going forward, because I think this stuff is super important.